Um, without further ado, I'll hand over to our first speaker, who's Dr. Philip um, Robinson, who's a native of County Antrim. Um, I first heard uh, Philip talk earlier this year on um, foot and mouth, and it was it was an excellent talk. So I, I'm setting you up now, Philip. You'll have to deliver. Um, Philip is head of the Department of Animal Health, Behaviour, and Animal Welfare at Harper Adams University in Shropshire, in England. He developed his interest in uh, livestock growing up as a beef suckler farmer uh, near Ballymena and qualified as a veterinary surgeon from the University of Glasgow. Um, he's worked in mixed veterinary practice in Northern Ireland and Scotland uh, before he joined DERA or the department in the north and now uh, at the time it would be known as DARD. Spent 12 years there, one of which was 2001 um, during the foot and mouth outbreak. He left the veterinary service to study for his P PhD in uh, bovine TB, and on completion of that, he joined the Harper Adams as a senior lecturer in 2014. Um, he spent nearly a year then as a, as a senior lecturer in charge of veterinary public health at the University of Glasgow before he returned to um, Harper last September as the, as the head of department. Um, he, as I mentioned, he's going to uh, cover the, his experience of diagnosing foot and mouth in 2001. And um, it's something that definitely brought a chill to me when I heard the, the talk earlier in the year. So with that, Philip, I'll hand over you, to you, if you don't mind. Okay, thank you very much, June, and a very good evening to everyone. I hope that you can hear me. Joe, can you confirm that? I can hear you anyway, Philip. Okay, that's good. I'll keep going. Um, so greetings from Harper Adams University in Shropshire in the West Midlands. But as June said, I am a native of County Antrim. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of foot and mouth disease in 2001, just over 20 years ago in Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and then give you some personal reflections on my own experience of dealing with this disease in that outbreak. So we often have people ask us questions like, where were you when such and such a thing happened? Like, where were you when man landed on the moon or whatever it might be? But for me, foot and mouth disease is one of those um, very, very significant events in my life. And what happened in 2001 will always be etched in my memory. So foot and mouth has a very long history in the British Isles and the first documented case was in 1839 in England and it happened in Ireland in, in that same year as well. And this paper by Ferguson says that the disease was short in its sojourn, mild in its effects, extremely easy of treatment and yielding to the simplest remedies. Now, that certainly was not our experience in 2001 as I'll come on to describe. So foot and mouth um, rumbled on, it appeared, disappeared right back from 1839. But in the immediate decades before 2001 in uh, Great Britain, there were problems with foot and mouth. So in 66, there was an outbreak in Northumberland, 67 in Hampshire, but then a huge outbreak in 67 to 68, which started actually not too far away from here in Shropshire. And it started on a pig farm and it ended up affecting more than 2,000 farms. There was um, a small outbreak in 1981 in Jersey and Isle of Wight, and that was thought to have uh, been airborne blowing over from Brittany and France. But then we come to 2001, which was a huge epidemic from a point source, uh, an affected farm in Northumberland, in the northeast of England. And it spread very quickly from the beginning and it lasted from February until September. And the movement of animals and also aerosol spread meant that the disease was very quickly and very widely spread right across Britain. And it ended up resulting in 6 million animals being slaughtered. 4 million of those for disease control reasons, but 2 million for welfare reasons. So how did it start? Well, the first suspicion of the presence of foot and mouth was found in a pig slaughterhouse in Essex in the southeast of England at anti-mortem inspection, and that's inspection before slaughter. And that was the 19th of February 2001. And the vet suspected foot and mouth disease and raised the alarm, which I think was quite an incredible thing, given that we hadn't seen uh, foot and mouth for a very long time in Britain. It was confirmed the following day, but 
by that point, it's estimated that at least 57 farms in Britain had already been infected by that confirmation date. But it resulted in more than 2,000 farms being infected in total. Now, it was first detected in the abattoir, but the source, the original source, was actually a pig farm in the northeast of England, so quite a long way away from Essex. And it was found subsequently, after tracing back, that this farm was, treating, was feeding untreated uh, waste human food to the pigs, which obviously contained the foot and mouth disease virus. So markets were very important in Britain in the 2001 outbreak. And I'm just going to give you um, a timeline of what um, we think happened. So it started in this pig farm at Hedden on the Wall in Northumberland. And that farm was estimated to have been infected around the 7th of February using trace back on the age of lesions in the pigs that were seen there. Um, a viral plume um, seems to have moved from that farm. So pigs generate aerosol, goes up into the air and blew in the wind about five kilometers to a nearby sheep and cattle farm. So now sheep get infected. And 16 of those sheep moved from that farm to Hexham Market, also in Northumberland, on the 13th of February. And then 10 of those sheep move on to Longtown Market in Cumbria. And that was the devastating uh, point in this outbreak. And now it's thought that 24,500 sheep were exposed in Longtown Market between the 14th and the 23rd of February that year. There were 181 purchasers of sheep from that market. And so the virus moved all over the country um, with the dispersal of the sheep from that market. And a national movement ban in Britain was instituted on the 23rd of February. So what were the particular features of that 2001 GB epidemic? Well, first of all, there was a delayed detection on the index farm. So that's the first farm that was affected, that, that one in Northumberland. Um, the first detection or the first suspicion and then confirmation was obviously in an abattoir. And then they had to work backwards to trace how did it get into the abattoir? Where did it come from? So it took some time for the source of the epidemic to actually be tracked down. Another key feature was the movement of infected sheep through markets um, before the first detection. So all of this activity was going on with these sheep moving through Longtown particularly, and then being spread all over the country. The time of year was perfect for foot and mouth. It was a cold time of year, and that meant the virus could survive for longer in the environment. And it was also a time of year where there was a huge amount of sheep movement. And lastly, there was a lot of silent infection in sheep, and it was thought that there was a, a lack of clinical signs in sheep that was very hard to detect the disease. But as I'll come on to mention later, what I saw in sheep was very, very obvious. So meanwhile, that was all going on um, in, in, in England, what was going on across the water in, in Ireland. So on the Thursday, the 22nd of February, and I remember this very well, I was at a DARD veterinary conference in Enniskillen. So it was a, a veterinary service conference. And there we were, a lot of representatives, vets, animal health inspectors, and so on. But the conference ended prematurely. And it was announced that foot and mouth disease had been confirmed and that we were all sent back to the divisional offices. And then a huge uh, import tracing uh, exercise began to find all the imports from GB and to visit those farms to check the animals that had come in from across the water, obviously looking for signs of foot and mouth disease. So that continued right through the weekend. And then, lo and behold, the Tuesday, 27th of February, the suspicion of foot and mouth in Mike and South Armagh. And that was subsequently confirmed and Newry Divisional Veterinary Office became the local episodic disease control centre. So in total, there were four outbreaks in Northern Ireland. The first one was in Armagh, and that was first reported by a veterinary officer from the department. 
Um, number two was was some time later. There was a, there was quite a gap, and that was in Tyrone, and that was uh, reported by a private vet. And then the very um, next day after that confirmation was the outbreak that I was involved in in County Antrim, and that was first reported by a private vet. And then the last one was again in, in Tyrone, and that was reported by the herd owner. So I'm now going to speak about my own personal recollections of uh, the 14th of April in particular, um, which I would say was the day that I will never forget. So as I said, the confirmation of uh, the uh, outbreak in Tyrone was the previous day. Um, I was back in my bachelor days. I was still living on the home farm. And uh, Saturday morning, I came down for breakfast. I was due to into the office because we were in high alert for foot and mouth. But uh, when I went to breakfast, I didn't know that uh, the disease had been confirmed again for a second time in Northern Ireland, and my mother passed on the news. So I, I went into work that morning with some um, trepidation, knowing that uh, the disease had reared its head again. And within um, 15 minutes, I would say, um, I got a call into the office to say that there was a hot suspect um, out uh, towards Cushion Doll, and uh, would I go and look at it? So I was the first vet from the department to go to the farm. And so I remember parking on the road and walking up the laneway um, in my white suit and um, was met by the vet and the farmer and, and another chap on the farm. And I started to inspect uh, the animals on that farm. And it didn't take me long to come to a conclusion that this uh, was indeed foot and mouth disease. I remember um, asking the farmer to put some of the suckler cows into the crush. And um, I opened the mouth of one of these animals and, and grabbed its tongue to do an oral examination. And the epithelium of the tongue actually sloughed off in my hand. So the, the lesions that I saw in cattle and in sheep were textbook lesions for foot and mouth disease. Huge swellings, vesicles, as we call them, big blisters um, on the tongue, inside the uh, mouth, and uh, also on the, the bulbs of the heels uh, at the feet uh, with animals with temperatures and dull and salivating. So it was classic foot and mouth disease. And so I, I passed on the bad news to headquarters in Belfast, and I very well remember standing on the phone, passing on that news, and I was asked, are you sure it's foot and mouth? And I said, 100%. So then the colleagues started to arrive on the farm, and we took samples to send off to Purbright Laboratories for confirmation that it was indeed foot and mouth disease virus that was present on the farm. But the cull of those animals began on that day. And so I uh, joined that cull, and uh, my particular job was to um, euthanize lambs. So that was a horrendous day. We were killing sheep, we were killing cattle. And when I left the farm that night, I couldn't go back home um, for the following six weeks or so uh, because we had cattle at home and I had to stay elsewhere. And I remember very well sitting in a chair that night when all the events of the day came to my mind, I sat in a chair and cried. So what did this end up as? It was four farms infected and confirmed with foot and mouth, and that resulted in 50,000 animals being um, slaughtered from 400 farms, and 80% of the animals killed were sheep. There were uh, one kilometre and three kilometre contiguous culls, and that resulted in a lot of animals being killed, and then either burned on pyres or rendered. The public sector cost in Northern Ireland was 24 million pounds. Um, and in Great Britain, the public cost was three billion pounds with six and a half million animals being slaughtered. So this was the biggest foot and mouth disease um, event the country had ever seen. Of course, the disease also ended up in Ireland and also in the Netherlands and France. So that was financial cost, but there's also a human cost of foot and mouth in 2001. And um, this is a quote from a social scientist who wrote about the disease afterwards and said, 
the vets cared for the animals in life, the animals at the point of death, and the animals after death, pastorally for the farmers, for their own sensitivity to slaughter and suffering, and the necessary self-protection that goes along with this in order to retain sanity. Another social scientist, the scale of killing, death, was in the wrong place at the wrong time and on the wrong scale. And again, the disease epidemic was a human tragedy, not just an animal one. The stress, feelings of bereavement, fear of a new disaster, loss of trust. And so for me, when I think back those 20 years ago, these are some of the things that stick in my head uh, in connection with foot and mouth. White suits, we wore a lot of white suits. And that picture of people in white suits is etched to my memory. Teamwork, it was an incredible time of, of pulling together as a veterinary service and with private practitioners. We had a job to do. It wasn't a pleasant job, but it was a vitally important job. Smoke, I can still smell the smoke from the fires, the huge pyres that were built um, to burn animals that were slaughtered on infected premises and, and nearby. Logistics, the, the scale of the enterprise in organizing the cull and organizing the building of pyres and organizing cleansing and disinfection. And the army were involved in that one as well. Just the scale of the logistics was incredible. Pistol shots, I remember animals being shot on that farm on that first day on the 14th of April, one by one, one after another. I remember looking in sheep mouths, hundreds of them for weeks, looking for lesions of foot and mouth disease. And most of all, I remember animal carcasses going onto farms that had just been culled out where there were dead animals, hundreds of them just lying, waiting to be collected and either burnt on a pyre or taken away for rendering. So this exotic disease threat is continual. We always have to be on alert for foot and mouth disease and other exotic diseases. And this picture is of European vets working in Asia, dealing with foot and mouth disease. Why would the European Union send people to Asia? Well, a threat anywhere in the world is a threat to everywhere else in the world. There's always the threat of illegal importation of animal products or indeed animals. There's the threat of waste human food being fed illegally to livestock. There's the movement of transportation of animals across Europe. And it doesn't take long for animals that could be subclinically infected with the disease to move from one part of Europe to another. There's a global movement of people and products. And obviously these viruses can, can last in an environment for some time, depending on what virus it is. And also, the loss of control that we have to some extent with outdoor production and obviously with our livestock, main livestock species, they're outdoors, there are biosecurity risks. And so that threat is always there and we always need to be ready. We always need to be prepared. We always need to be suspicious. And so that brings me to the end of my presentation and thank you very much indeed for listening. Thanks very much, um, Philip, for that very interesting talk. 20 years on, it's hard to believe it's 20 years ago. Um, I'm sure you still remember it like it was yesterday.